And what we're doing is we're going to sit on top of a Falcon 9 rocket, and it's going to take us all the way to outer space where we're in orbit, flying around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. And we're going to stay there until we actually turn the spacecraft around and fire a rocket to slow down, and then we re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and, and that's very hard to do. Hey there, I am super excited. Today, I have a new success interview for you on my Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Today, it was my privilege, and I really mean privilege, to interview Jared Isaacman. You already know. A passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs, that, that's on their way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. You see, Jared has an amazing story. Let me take you back a few years when he was 16 years old and he wanted to start a company. He went to his parents and says, Mom, Dad, I'm going to start a company and that's going to require me to quit high school. And that's exactly what he did. So from the basement of his parents' house, he grew this company that would soon become a multi billion dollar company. And now his company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the name of the company is Shift for Payments. Let me tell you, it was great to have him on the show and we talk about leadership. I ask him, hey, what's the makeup of a great leader? I ask him, well, what if someone wants to start a business or become an entrepreneur? What advice do you have? He gives several pieces of advice. I ask him, do you believe in luck? And he gives his response with that as well. Just a great interview. But the one thing that brought us together, and by the way, let me just mention, he did go back and get his high school diploma and also a college degree. He did say that that was important as well. But one thing that brought us together was this whole SpaceX and Inspiration4 mission. And he's gonna talk about that, but let me just lay it out for you. You know, this Inspiration4 mission is gonna be pretty cool. It's the first time in history that four civilians are gonna go to space and back. Not only that, they're gonna go to space and orbit the Earth. Unbelievable, and guess what? One thing you're gonna see in this interview is all the early decisions that Jared made that brought him to this point of meeting Elon Musk and SpaceX and then being chosen to be the pilot and the commander of this first full civilian rocket that's going to go into space and back home again. And I tell you what, he talks about that and also his connection with St. Jude and wanting to do whatever he can do to help eradicate childhood cancer. That's humbling in and of itself. We're going to talk in this interview about life, about success, about achievement. If you followed me for any length of time, you know that I get the opportunity to interview some of the highest achievers in the world. We're talking New York Times bestselling authors. We're talking thought leaders, business owners. We're talking about celebrities and professional athletes. I've had the opportunity to interview and Jared was amazing. Now, if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, hey, I invite you to subscribe and also make sure you click that notification bell so that you're the first to be notified when I come out with a new success interview like this one or a motivational message. Also, make sure you go over to iTunes or Apple Podcast, type in my name, TJ Hoisington, and I invite you, I humbly invite you to subscribe. Now, without any further ado, you're going to be inspired by this interview. All right, so let's jump right into it. Jared, welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited. You know, I am super excited. When I saw your name pop up in the news, I immediately started Googling you and finding out all I could about you and your story. And I got to say, it's a privilege, and I truly mean that to have you on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. And I'll say for the record, your staff was amazing to work with. And so I really appreciate you being here today. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And again, I mean, we love telling the inspiration for a story and getting the good word out. So uh, it was great. It's great to be able to connect with you and, and share it. One of the first things that I like to do with all my guests is to have them 
sort of share their biography, share a little bit of their background. I think if you could give our audience, as we have all, all types of different listeners, but a lot of entrepreneurs, we have a lot of business owners, leaders, and so forth. It'd be great to hear kind of the early years. Would you give us some of your story, please? Sure. Uh, so first, and my uh, my parents are completely responsible for this. Uh, I um, there is a huge age gap between myself and my older brothers and sisters. So um, my older brother is 15 years older than me. My sister is 12 years older than me. My other brother is 10 years older than oh. me. So um, you know, I kind of came along a little bit later in life, and you know, by the time I'm in middle school, you know, I'm watching them at you know college or beginning their careers, and I was saying, you know, I. How do I how do I accelerate this timeline a little bit? You know, I I didn't um, I guess in high school, you know, um, like raising your hand to get permission to go to the bathroom or something like none of those really I think fit with me. And I I wanted to kind of get out and start experiencing the world a little bit earlier in life. Um, you know, just the way that my older brothers and sister was was doing things. So uh, I left high school when I was 16 years old to start uh, a company uh, in my parents' basement. I I had some exposure to this payments industry. Uh, from a part-time job that I had um, just prior to that. And I worked there for about six months and saw a lot of opportunity within the, the world of payments. Um, maybe just to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, if do. you think about 1999, 2000, if you're a consumer and you wanted a credit card to go spend, that's no problem. It shows up in your mailbox in like a week. But if you were a business, you know, say you are, you're a pizza place and you just want to accept credit cards, uh, the paperwork process to do that was like comparable to getting a commercial mortgage. Like it was just mm -hmm. ridiculous. There was no efficiency, no optimization. So, so this was the opportunity I saw early on in, in life. And, um, you know, great basement startup story, lived in the basement, you know, uh, in fact, that was all I did for like three years and um, was actually almost getting a little bit burnt out. I needed a hobby. I needed something else in my life. That's where I picked up my childhood passion for, for aviation I started flying in 2004. I just sprinted at it. I uh, went right to jets, ex-military aircraft, air shows and such, and, you know, um, built up, um, you know, went on a number of really great adventures for mm -hmm. sure. And I've had aviation in my company has been like pretty much my entire adult life. No, that's really great. And uh, and it's been amazing to watch some of the things you've done in the aviation world. Just unbelievable. We'll talk about that in a second, but digging into your backstory just a little bit. You're looking up to your brothers and sisters, sister, one sister, two si one sister, one brother. sister. Um, and you're seeing their life progress. And then you get this idea that life is maybe moving too slow for you and some of your dreams. So you step out, but you happen. I, I, I did read this, I think on CNBC or somewhere that you were working at an old company called Comp USA. Is that the six month uh, tenure that you had? Was that it? I mean, I'm, I guess what I'm really getting at is where did you discover that there was a problem in the market? Yeah, so I, I gave you the I gave you the the abridged version. So I mean, I, I if to expand on a little bit more, yeah. when I was in high school, myself and another uh, friend of mine, Brendan Lauber, we created a you know a teenager computer business. We called it Deco Systems. And we were just doing web design and basic computer work. So I worked at CompUSA, which is a big uh, computer retailer at the time. I think they've since gone out of business. And what I did was um, I basically poached customers. Like I did my job selling what I was supposed to, right. computers and such. But if somebody came in and said they had an issue that I thought I could be helpful with outside of work hours, I did that. And one of the uh, customers who came in uh, was from a company called MSI, mm -hmm. and MSI did early, you know, early years credit card processing. Um, they enabled businesses to accept credit cards as a form of payment. And uh, I did what I was doing, which was I, you know, proposed my, you know, that I would be able to help them. And uh, and I wound up working there a little bit on the side and solved their problems. And then they offered me a job. And I worked there for six months. Um, you know, I left high school. I got my GED. I, later on, I got my college degree. So I, I still oh, believe. In I was going to ask you about that. Okay, you did. All right. I still believe in the, you know, the track. I think it, it does work. So, right. um, but anyway, I worked at that company MSI for six months. And then uh, that's when I eventually left and said, um, uh, you know, there's probably a better way to do it and created my, my company. Well, unbelievable. And MSI, they went on to be bought by UPS, I think I read or something like that. Actually, we acquired them in 2014. So it came back full circle. Oh, you're um, kidding. Nope. Oh, isn't that? Wow. That's awesome. So here you are, 16-year-old in your basement with a good friend of yours. You build this company. You're working at a, at a company and you're 
poaching customers. You're at least you're doing, a, I, I imagine your nature is to do a good job working. Yeah. But as you were working with customers, you started to find this deficiency in the marketplace. And um, it was from there that led to, you know, merchant services and so forth that kind of got you off the ground, right? I mean, so it's just pretty cool. What I see in that is from an early age, you were an entrepreneur. You were always looking for that opening somewhere. I, and I just think it's amazing that you saw this as you were doing transactions. You saw this little problem or difficulty that was going on. You thought you could streamline it. I think that's, that's an amazing story. So Yeah. Uh, look, I think there was an element of luck to it also, right? I, I think the ball certainly, you know, bounced my way a couple of times over the years. You know, um, you know, if if that person from MSI didn't come into CompUSA that day with a problem, right? I might never have been able to identify the opportunities that exist in that industry and never would have been able to create a, a great company, you know, to support it. So um, definitely been very fortunate in my career. What would you say? What, maybe I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but what? how would you define luck? Well, I, I think you, you have to be prepared, um, you know, for the opportunities that are presented to you in life, right? Um, and just hope that you are well prepared to capitalize on them when it happens. I mean, there is a there is a degree of randomness, right? I mean, there are things that happen every single day. And if you're in the right place at the right time and well prepared, you can capitalize on them or, or benefit, which I certainly did throughout my career on, on more than one occasion, right? But um, I think there, you know, I, I do often, you know, reflect back on a lot of things that have happened throughout my career and, you know, decisions I've made and opportunities that have been presented. And I know some of them, uh, you know, myself and my team helped create those opportunities. And some of them, you were just in the right place at the right time. And, and you have to be fortunate for that when it comes around. I love that. Um, my daughter was asking, I was, I, was, I was taking her to practice for her school she was asking, could you ask him, was he a, what did she say? Were you a genius, like a tech genius, or were you more of a visionary, would you say? Oh, um, I, I certainly wouldn't uh, try and categorize myself as a, as a genius or, you know, I, I think... Um, <laughs> I think I try and apply a lot of like, you know, critical thinking to problems that I see and, you know, challenge, is there a better way to do it? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the, the differences I've seen between, um, you know, entrepreneurs that have been successful in their career versus those that aren't um, is the willingness to challenge, um, you know, conventional thinking um, or accepting that things are just going to have to be a certain way forever because that's the way they always have been. Um, you know, those who kind of, you know, trick themselves into believing that's the way it is. Like it's, um, you know, sometimes it's like the can't do, you know, type of attitude. Um, they have a harder time, you know, progressing in their careers, I think, versus, you know, seeing problems for what they are or accepting, you know, or looking at inefficiencies and saying that there's a better way to do it. Um, that's kind of the approach I've tried to take throughout my career. And I think it's worked really well for me in the early days of the business. And now, you know, as the problems that we try and conquer and solve are much, much grander than our basement days, you're still trying to uh, apply the same type of critical thinking and way to work through those issues. Huge. I mean, to think that you were 16 years old, you ended up building a 200 billion, if I get the numbers wrong, please correct me, but you built a $200 billion company, shift for, for payments. You now have a new product um, unveiled called shift for shop. And what is that? Would you, do you mind telling the audience what that is? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, throughout our history, we've we've tried to focus on, you know, the more as a payments company, the more complex end of, um, you know, the spectrum. And what I refer to that spectrum, say, um, most people are familiar with like Square or PayPal, right. and they excel in uh, the most extreme, uh, simplistic end of the payment spectrum, you know, coffee shops and food trucks and such, where there's not a lot of, you know, commerce enabling software going on. Well, throughout our, you know, 21 year history, we've gravitated towards the other end of the spectrum where it's like everything is super complicated. So our customers are, you know, Hyatt or Caesars Palace or, you know, um, pretty much every major ski resort you can think of where there's like a lot of things going on, like Pebble Beach, for example, you've got three hotels, three spas, they, you know, three golf courses, they all have to integrate and sync, you know, together. That's, that's complicated stuff. 
And as a result, throughout our history, we've grown where, you know, about one third of all the restaurants and hotels in this country use some form of shift four technology. Um, but we've always wanted to, you know, diversify from there into, you know, more everyday commerce where, you know, everyday people could create a business and have an opportunity to, you know, thrive and, and grow and expand. And, and, and it's, you, you got to pull yourself out of the complex world in order to do that. You got to put yourself into a more simplistic product. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we've created with, with shift for shop because it enables literally anyone who has an idea for a business to create one. Um, it doesn't cost anything to, to use it or create your mm-hmm. web store. Um, and then, you know, you put it out there to the world and you see what happens. And a lot of great e-commerce businesses began just like that. So that's what shift for shop is very similar to some of the other, you know, shops that people may have heard of that enable uh, people to create these e-commerce businesses. But, but we approach it with a, a much different, more disruptive pricing model where we make it accessible to everyone. Um, and we're pretty excited about it. I did notice that online is that you get a lot, even for signing up for the free version, you, 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 you get a, there's a lot of benefits there that maybe some of your you know, competitors don't offer. So what advice, before we move on to your flying and piloting and so forth, what advice would you have for any person maybe graduating from high school, maybe the first couple of years in college, they want to start their own business or they want to be an entrepreneur? Do you have any core principles of success as a piece of advice to the listeners? Oh, well, I, I mean, geez, I could, I could talk all day on that. First, I'd say like, don't, don't be too quick to get off the, uh, you know, the, the, the well-worn path, right? Um, because that's giving people exposure and opportunities to learn things that they might not be familiar with. Because it's easy to say like, follow your passions, follow your dreams. You know, if you love what you do, you never work every day. There's a lot of cliches like that and such too. But like, you don't know everything. The world has a lot to offer, right? And you could wind up being, you know, being one of the best at a profession that you know nothing about today. And if you, if you depart that path early on, you may never get those opportunities. So first I'd say like, I've met a lot of entrepreneurs who have been very successful a little bit later in their careers after they've got a lot of experience and exposure, even a little wisdom, um, from just, you know, progressing on the path that, you know, again, it's well-worn, but, but it does work to some degree. So I'd say, you know, don't, don't be too quick to, to jump off the, the track a little bit. But, but when you do find something that you're very passionate about, and it most importantly has real opportunity behind it, because that's also another mistake I, I've seen. You know, people who, you know, have a passion for, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, auto racing or something. And they, they're going to open up a, a you know, a, an auto race modification store, but they're putting it in the same place that there's three others. There might not be a lot of opportunity there, you know? So not only do you have to be passionate about it, but you have to know that there's something wrong, something you can fix, something that you can make better. Right. And, and then I totally believe you should, you should give it at all. It should be one of your top priorities in life because starting a business is hard. And many do fail along the way. So it doesn't leave a lot of opportunity for other things in your life to be a distraction if you want to be a, you know, part of the, the smaller percentage of the odds that actually overcome and prevail. You, you got to be very focused and give it everything you've got. And then the last thing I'd say is like really obsess over your decision making, right? Like one of, mm. one of the worst things you can do for sure is being indecisive. Like not making decisions can be you know, one of the worst you know, decisions. Right. Right. But when you do learn from every one of them and still today, like I'll go back and look at emails I wrote 15 years ago, 10 years ago Mm -hmm. to see if the decision was right, how it played out and how it can shape my thought process going forward. And I think that's how you move from, you know, being in a top, you know, 5% in your particular category or industry or vertical, and you continue to progress up to the top because you refine your thinking constantly. Those are just a, a couple things I would suggest. And what I heard in the spirit of that last point is that constant and never ending improvement and Absolutely. being able to look at the mistakes you've made, learn from them and the successes and what was, you know, what, what, what things can be pulled out of that to learn and grow in the future. I think, wow, that's really good. Thank you for those points. Very good. You said, I read in an interview I really never had a hobby outside of work. It became a 100 hour work week. And that's why, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said as part of that conversation, you said making a lot of money isn't enough. And so it was your childhood dream to go to space. And so you ventured in to becoming a pilot. Give us a little bit of that story of how that all came about. That's pretty cool. Cause you yeah, were, well, cause you were, cause you were flying fighter jets. I just find that, I mean, amazing when I read that 
you're flying in unison. And then your team sent me some video of you flying in, in unison, 18 inches apart. You've got to give us the overview of that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it, it's totally true that I, uh, I needed a hobby. I always had a childhood passion for aviation. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I was playing, you know, flight simulators on computers I built and such. And, you know, it, um, it was always there. But then my, my true love and my, my passion immediately became the business. Once you create it, like, it's just like I said before, you, you gotta, you gotta really try and minimize, you know, distractions and outside interest because odds are stacked against you right from the start. But I can think about, I was probably three or four years into the, the company and, you know, you're just waking up on your keyboard every day and then you're doing it over again. And for as many successes as we've had, I felt like, geez, like there has to be more in my life than, than just this. And um, so I picked up flying. And I started flying in 2004 and I never slowed down. Uh, if I looked for any reason to fly, it was therapeutic. If it was night, I could just go up and, you know, just chill and, uh, and look out in the sky. And, um, and that led me very quickly to flying jets, which uh, led me to, um, you know, flying ex-military aircraft, which led to air shows. Um, and, you know, even then just talking about business and entrepreneurship, you know, when we were flying air shows, that was purely a hobby event, um, you know, relatively high risk one uh, at that. Yeah. And it was, how do we pivot this into something commercial? Like, this is unique. You know, civilians don't fly fighter jets. Like, there has to be some need here, some problem to solve. And it turned out there was a huge one inside the Department of Defense, which led to creating a defense aerospace business that went from, you know, when we first started, the Air Force said, there's no problem here for you to solve. We, we thought otherwise. It became a $6 billion industry by the time, uh, you know, I left the, uh, the organization just a year ago. Um, so anyway, that's just an example of, you know, you got a passion, but you spot opportunity and you can, you can turn it into something commercial. You are like a master problem solver. It seems like, I mean, you, you see a problem in the marketplace and you go, there's probably an easier way to do this. I had that thought that you just answered. Did the air force think that they even had a deficiency? And no, they did not. <laughs> And here you filled that because you had your eyes open. You had a passion for something. Did it just come to you late at night or was it your team that gathered around and you, as you got involved, you started to notice, Hey, there's an opportunity here. Is that how that kind of came about? Yeah, it was definitely a team effort for sure. Um, I mean, we were, you know, you're totally brothers with everybody when you're flying air shows because you are 18 inches apart and you have to have immense trust, uh, you know, because obviously a lot can go wrong. And, you know, we, we had plenty of time to sit around the table and discuss this and say, you know, there is an opportunity here with the military because just simply, you know, well, first, it's a good assumption in general that the government is not going to be very cost effective or efficient on anything they do. It's a good starting assumption. I agree. Right? Yes. And, and then you look at budgetary environments and some of the bureaucracy. And, yeah. it was just, there, there was a lot there to support our position. And then you just had to take some risks. And, um, and we did. Um, we went out and we started buying fighter jets from all over the world. But the Air Force told us, no, uh, they, I still have a copy of the letter where it said, there is no requirement for what you're trying to accomplish here. And that was in 2014. And 18 months later, we had our first contract uh, with the Air Force. 18 months thereafter, it became a $6 billion industry. So it can happen really quick once you prove it out. Wow. That's inspirational in and of itself. You said this in an interview, my 6,000 jet flight hours most of the training came down to about six hours of it. And those are the things you don't expect that you need to prepare for. Give, give us a little bit more of a vision behind that, because I think there's a lot in that little statement. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it, I think that, you know, just to give a little more context to it, um, people were asking me about, you know, flying the Dragon spacecraft in, in orbit. And, um, you know, it's, it's a product of Elon Musk and SpaceX. So, you know, it's good technology. It's yeah. going to work. There's a lot of automation there, but it was, you know, are you prepared to manually operate it or if there's an emergency or a contingency and it's, look, that's, you prepare for that, you know, 0.01% chance. It's the same flying an airplane, you know, flown 6,000 hours and 99.9% .9 of the time, the autopilot did what it was supposed to and all the systems were good and the lights, you know, were out, there's no warning. But, you know, you do train for the possibility that something goes wrong and unex something unexpected. Right. Um, and, you know, that's no different, you know, in my normal aviation career as it will be flying in outer space. Um, you know, 99% of the time, everything does exactly what it's supposed to. It's just that small percentage that you need to prepare for. Okay, let me pull something out of that. 
So when, when I heard you say that, my thought was, you know, Richard Bandler once said, the mind likes what's the same, but it learns from what is different. And so I think that there's a, based on what you've said, there's, a, there's an even bigger principle that, that anyone could apply, and it's this principle. And, and feel free to, to adjust anything that I say here. But I'm thinking you can't grow inside of a comfort zone. The real learning, I think, in life happens in those anomaly situations, right? You learn from what's not normal sometimes, and you do want to be prepared for them. And so I love the idea that you can have all these 6,000 hours of flight training and time up in the air, but really it comes down to those six. And it's, I think, um, I would imagine that that's where people really grow is in the parts that aren't familiar. Any thoughts around that? I, I agree completely. I mean, I'm, I'm actually here in Montana right now and um, my kids who are four and seven are learning how to uh-huh. ski. And my you know comment to them is if you continue to go down just the, the green circle every single time, sure, you may never fall, but you're not actually growing as a, as a skier. And I, I, I think you can compare that to anything in business, right? If you're staying completely on the path the entire time, you know, getting very caught up in the status quo, you're, you're not going to grow as, a, as an individual, an entrepreneur, as a leader, because you're not challenging yourself. Um, so yeah, I, I think that this, that one example on flight hours, you can probably take it in a few different directions. Yeah, you can. So I just want to say for the audience, make sure that if you're, I, I, I imagine a lot of people are not comfortable right now, given the, the pandemic that we're in right now, but just generally speaking, if you feel pretty comfortable on your path, maybe you should disrupt it, right? There are no sacred cows. Make sure that you're looking for more opportunities. Make sure that you're growing, you're educating yourself, stretching beyond who you were yesterday to continually grow. And I, I get the sense that's sort of the way you think about life. Yeah, and, and those that I admire as well. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. if you take uh, Elon Musk, for example, um, he, he has the most efficient rockets to put, you know, payload in orbit. He was disruptive and to the entire industry. No one can compete in the United Launch Alliance. No one else. He didn't have to make the rockets land on ships. Yeah. He didn't have to have that recovery. He probably took, and this is just a guess, he might have had 20, 30% EBITDA margins. The moment he built in reusability, could have gone to 60%. He can then take the cash flows that come from that reinvested back in his business to build even more competitive differentiators, to build higher walls and deeper modes to make anyone else who's even thinking about encroaching on a space have that much harder of an uphill battle. Now, you can apply that into any number of industries of pushing yourself and not getting comfortable to give yourself the edge to reinvest back in to make yourself an even bigger and stronger business. Mm, love it. Okay. Give us the story about how you connected with Elon Musk. This is great because this all leads into inspiration for and the work that you're doing with St. Jude. So so give us the beginning. I mean, was it easy? Did you just call him up? Did you have his phone number? How did that work? Well, well I'll, I'll avoid, you know, uh, naming specific names in this, uh, Fair. To, but, I, but I will say that, um, you know, I was first exposed to the commercial space flight industry in 2008 after I flew my... Um, uh, the world record flights. And um, basically there were those in, in that industry who it was still very immature at the time, you know, Elon mm-hmm. and SpaceX were still in the very early days of, you know, commercial space exploration, commercial rocket development right. and such. But they suspected that I might have an interest in what they were doing. And it was totally true. And I was invited to go to uh, Bank of North Kazakhstan to see the Soyuz go up. Um, and that was an incredible experience. And I basically said, look, I'm, I'm in, you know, whenever, whenever the opportunity presents itself, please keep me in mind because I know we have to solve some, some U S responsibilities first. We gotta, we gotta, you know, ensure there's this next, next vehicle for NASA to get to space once the shuttle retires. But, but when the timing is right, I'd love to be there as everybody works towards this broader, you know, ambition of, um, you know, enabling everyone to go journey among the stars. Right. Now, it took a little bit of time, and I had to knock on the door and remind them from time to time that I'm still very interested. And uh, just about three months ago, uh, the opportunity did present itself. Now, what I had no idea was is that it was going to be the first or that it would come so soon, because this was presented to me even before NASA's Crew-1 flight. So the U.S. had only just returned two people to space on Demo-2 when this opportunity was presented. And that was nearly 10 years since shuttle retired. So it was pretty early on, and I was all in. 
And then you just knowing that it is the first and that it has some historical significance, then you just got to be very thoughtful about what you want, what message you want to send to the world. And that came down to how we're picking our crew, who's going to represent this mission and what organization we stand, you know, should stand to benefit like St. Jude. Love it. Did you, through the years of doing your piloting and training and so forth and flying, did you always have in the back of your mind, one day I'm going to space? I did. I, 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 to be honest, I felt like there was going to be some chance at some point, um, which is why actually when I went to Crew One's launch uh, at Kennedy Space Center and mm-hmm. I watched the four of them go up on the Falcon, and of course I definitely said, you know, you know, someday that's that's going to be me in that rocket. I was also thinking about because we already knew this crew selection process that we were going to find everyday people to join us, and I was like, now imagine them. They never, they're not thinking about this at all. They're going about their lives every day. And one's a great healthcare worker and such, but in a very short period of time, a couple months from now, you know, I'm going to be inviting three people who never would have thought they would have a chance to go to space to, to take part in this epic mission. And I was thinking about them and what was going through, you know, what, what they're what's going to go through their mind when we have that first conversation. So that's anyways, re- cool part of this. No, that's way cool. That's, that's really cool. Twinkle. This fall, Inspiration4 launches as the first all-civilian mission to space. And you could be on board. Up above the world so Visit inspiration4.com for your chance to go to space. You know, when you you shared that you kept knocking the door over time, checking in with Elon Musk or the team or whoever it was. It made me think of in 2004, my back was against the wall. Um, My world was really business wise was falling apart. I had left the Tony Robbins organization a few years earlier in the year 2000 or so forth. And I thought, I'm going to go out in the world and I'm going to become what I've always dreamt of being, which is what I'm doing now. But I remember my darkest moment was 2004 when we had to move in the basement of my parents' house and um, had two kids at the time. I have four now, but two kids at the time, they were little ones. And I told my wife, she said, maybe you should go get a job. And I said, you know what, honey, I think before I go get a job, I have to exhaust every idea I have for living my dream, if you will. And she says, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to write a book. She says, you're going to do what? You're going to write a book? You've never written a book before. She wrote me a four-page letter. I took the one car we had at the time, because one was repossessed back then, and I drove down to a a parking lot at a grocery store. And for two months I typed, but I remember at the end of those two months, sending out a three ring binder of my book to a bunch of best-selling authors and thought leaders and so forth. I sent out 20 copies of my book. And one of them happened to be a business owner for a publicly traded company at the time. And I remember every, for two months, I, I sent it to him and I called his assistant every day. My wife says it was like 80 times I called checking to see if he had read my book, what page he was on, so forth. Long story short, through that persistence, that's when I got my breakthrough. Because he called me up one day and he says, I've read your book and we have a big conference coming up with 15,000 people would love to have you come speak in front of our audience and make your book available for everybody. I said, well, how many people are you going to have there? He said, we're going to have 15,000 there. You should probably have 15,000 books. I said, no problem. I can do that. As I was thinking, there's no way financially I could do it. I called my brother, said, could I borrow the money? We print 15,000 books. I went and spoke, sold 15,000 copies. And then it was a couple months after that, that Charlie Tremendous Jones called me and said, a company needs 25,000 copies of your book. And it just sort of took off. I look back on that time and I just think persistence is the, you can have a dream all you want, but if you're not willing to knock on the door, if you're not willing to remind people, if you're not willing to bring value, like you've done, bring value to the marketplace so that you're believable, right? Incredible. But I will tell you, once that book was printed and sold almost 100,000 the first year, it just took off. My whole business 
and took off. And it was in that painful experience that I found my voice and I found out who I really was through pain. Any thoughts around any of those concepts from you? You know, I have a lot of thoughts around that. Um, I, I think that um, you learn an awful lot in those really dark moments in, in a person's career or their business journey. Uh, I think you can learn, you know, just, I mean, there's so much wisdom that is built through those challenging times. I actually, um, I think it made, it made me think of just my uh, mentor that I had uh, throughout uh, my business career, who actually, he was the CEO of MSI, the, the company I worked mm -hmm. at and later acquired. And it was tough love, uh, you know, and uh, like, I know that uh, a lot of, you know, my approach to problem solving and challenges today in business in general came from uh, not having an awful lot come easy to me, having to uh, fight for it a lot. My mentor had a big belief in that, um, he had kind of somewhat of a kind of a street upbringing. Uh, so he, he, he definitely like, it was like, if you, if you get to eat at the table, it's because you fought through a lot of other people to get there. Um, it did help me in a lot of ways. I'm not saying that I, I apply a lot of his thought process now to, to everything, but I do wonder too, when I think about today's generation of entrepreneurs and business leaders, having it maybe a little bit more of an easier path, um, because it's almost from a society perspective expected, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot more perks and such that come earlier on in a career. And, and I do wonder how that's going to impact people as they, they grow as leaders and mature in, in business where they haven't faced some of those dark moments that you referenced, because I, I do think there's so much learning that takes place from there that helps you become a better leader, better decision maker later in life. That's really great. Thank you for edifying us with that. Hey, what is your, okay, put your corporate leadership hat on real quick. What would you say makes for a great leader? What are some of those key, maybe top principles that you think of as you look at the last 20 plus years of building your company and working with leaders and meeting with leaders and seeing leaders come and go within your company? What do you see as maybe some core patterns of effective leadership? Well, I think you have to be able to, you know, uh, have the hearts and the minds, um, the energy and, and willingness of your workforce. Like you have to be inspiring. Um, you have to, you know, communicate. I think being a great communicator is very important. Um, look, I, you know, a lot of people in an organization are tasked with very specific things every single day. And without a bigger, greater purpose that they're working towards, um, they can lose interest. Um, and if they lose interest and move on, maybe your organization is better for it. But if they, if they lose interest and don't move on, then you actually can have some significant structural issues within a company. Uh, so communicating of what we're all working towards, even if somebody feels like maybe their particular, you know, part that they're playing in the story isn't, isn't the grandest, you know, they're not playing lead guitar, but they are part of the band. And without them, like, we don't, we don't like, we don't, you know, we don't succeed. Right. Uh, so I think like communicating, um, ensuring that like you do have like the hearts, minds, the commitment of your, of your people, and that they all are very aligned around our common goals is, is a big part of it. Um, and I think the, the being in the trenches, showing that you're there when, you know, the fight is on is also very important. Like I, I've certainly encountered a lot of, um, you know, a lot of leaders in other organizations where big things are happening and they're not visible. They're not present. Um, they're not communicating. Um, and you have to wonder the impact that that's going to have on the workforce who's saying if they're, you know, if my leader isn't here when things matter most, like when will they be there? Right. So I've tried to make a point of being very visible, even on what I think, you know, could be some of the smallest things on a day to day basis to know that, like, I'm there. I care. You know, I, I give a, you know, about what's being worked on at the right. moment. Um, and I, I think that builds trust um, and, and confidence in your workforce, which is also, I think, important um, component of leadership. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, I read somewhere that you did not meet with a client because of your young age until 2004 or something like that, that your dad was out there doing a lot of the front selling and so forth. I think that's a pretty cool story that you were just so young. You started so young that, wow. Yeah, I, I did go. I mean, I went on some sales calls with my father and, um, but yeah, I did try to avoid um, too much until I was at least 20. Um, and even then, you know, it's risky to go out on a business dinner with a fake ID. Uh, so, but yeah, the first four years, um, I, was, I was hidden in the basement for the, the bulk of the time. 
Yeah, well, one thing is for sure, you, those first four years, you were in the trenches and long beyond that. So when you say a leader needs to be, you know, just the feeling they need to be, you're involved with them and in the trenches with them to some degree, it's great to see that you've, you, you started off that way. You were there in the beginning. Really great. You said on CNBC, if you do believe there's going to be a world like the Jetsons where everybody jumps in their rocket, very Star Wars or Star Trek, and people are exploring new planets and new worlds, then we've got to get the first one right. We have, it's a big responsibility, you said. What was your thought around that? And how is that connected to St. Jude, for example? Well, I, I think there, there's two, two components of that. Okay. So first is... Um, Progress is important in the world. It's good for society. Like the advances we make as a society, ease suffering, um, make the world a better place than our past. Um, and that means doing things like venturing beyond our world and into new worlds and great things that can happen in space. But it also means you have to solve some of the problems that exist, you know, in the day. Like we have to balance both. That's where St. Jude comes into this because St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, they don't build rockets and they don't do space exploration. What they do is try and save the lives of sick kids that got dealt a really lousy hand in life. Um, and that's why we need to do both as part of Inspiration4. We have to you know, be successful in our grand fundraising effort. We have to try and conquer this you know, heart, heart-wrenching disease of childhood cancer. And, and that's why we're supporting St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. That's a big part of what we're trying to do with Inspiration4. The, the second part to the question about, you know, the first being a big responsibility is because if the first goes wrong, it sets back the timeline for everyone else. And um, I, I remember that, uh, you know, it, at Draken, which was my defense aerospace business, where, you know, half of the Air Force was reasonably supportive by 2015. The other half was not. And I was reminding our people every single day, like, this is an experiment. We are the first here. Um, we're the first civilian organization flying fighter jets against the good guys. And we're, we're you know, up until now, it was only ever done by the Air Force. Right. If we make a mistake, if there is an incident, and you can imagine in fighter jets, things go wrong, right? Um, this industry is over. Like, it, it, it ends right now. Like, we have to get this right and earn our place in this so that the industry has an opportunity to flourish. That's no different with Inspiration4. If, if we don't take this seriously, if we don't execute flawlessly, then our hope, you know, of space progress and allowing everyday people to follow and fulfill that Jetsons-like dream will be set back uh, by a significant time period. You said this is the first step. We're talking about Inspiration4. Right. I just think help color that picture here for the audience. What is inspiration for? You said the first step, this is the first step toward a world where everybody can go and venture among the stars. What does that end goal look like for you with that, that, that thought? And then how does inspiration for tie in? Yeah, I just, I can't imagine any of us ever watched a Star Trek or Star Wars and didn't picture ourselves, you know, on the, you know, on the enterprise or flying in an X-wing, like it's just a more interesting world when we're able to go out and venture among, you know, the stars, right. Um, to seek out, you know, new planets. And I mean, this is just, this is just like the exploration spirit that lives in all of us. Right. And goes back even, you know, to the beginning of humankind. So um yeah, I, I think that that's a world we all will live in one day. I actually have no mm -hmm. doubt. It may be 50 or 100 years from now, but you have to start somewhere. There has to be that first step. And, um, you know, when I try and help people, like, you know, visualize this, you know, uh, when Orville and Wilbur Wright had their first flight, you know, at Kitty Hawk, it was not impressive. Uh, I mean, from aviation standards, that powered flight did not go very far. But, you know, 20 years later, you had your first uh, airborne ambulances, you know, Charles Lindbergh, you know, flies across the Atlantic Ocean. One person got to experience what that was like, and it probably cost a lot of money. Twelve years later, Pan Am announces the first transatlantic commercial service where people could fly across the Atlantic Ocean. So this everything can happen so fast if we get this first one right. And, and that's what I think Inspiration4 is about. It's like the starter pistol of all to come. So what is it? You're going to take, you're going to lead or pilot. Is it, are you a commander or a pilot? What's the right I'm, term? I'm both. So, okay, um, commander and pilot of Inspiration4, where you're going to invite three civilians to come up with you into space. And how long are you going to be in space? What does that picture, what does that look like? Yeah, so it's going to be, um, 
it's going to be several days in low Earth orbit. And we are still, uh, so, you know, that's a big difference than some of, you know, what you might have read about with some of the other companies that do essentially what is just a big parabolic arc. You go up, you come right down. You're not actually in, you know, outer space. You, you touch the line and you come down. What we're doing is we're going to sit on top of a Falcon 9 rocket and it's going to take us all the way to outer space where we're in orbit flying around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. And we're going to stay there until we actually turn the spacecraft around and fire a rocket to slow down, and then we re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and, and that's very hard to do. And the only, uh, the only ones who've ever done it up until now were put there by a superpower, whether it's the US or China or Russia or the European Space Agency. They're the only ones who've ever put human beings into orbit before. But we're going to be the first private mission, the first all civilian missions that get, you know, get, get to have that amazing privilege. And again, that's why we're trying to be so thoughtful about how we're going to help out St. Jude along the way and conquer Earth's big problems and, and the people who are going to be representing this mission. Because I did not want, you know, four rich white guys uh, that are going up into space. I want everyday people who are super inspiring in their own right to be part of this amazing mission. Okay, so where should people go to find out more about it or to apply or whatever the program is? Sure. So I'd invite everyone go to inspiration4.com. And you can learn right about it. It's actually going to say right when you get to the website, this is how you have a chance to go to space, right? And you have two choices. You can actually do both. You can make a donation to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital because that's just a good thing to do, period. Right. And at the end of the month, we're going to um, select someone at random who's going to represent the mission spirit of generosity. And that will be someone who made a donation to St. Jude that now has this chance to, to go to space as a crew member on Inspiration4. And the other path is for an entrepreneur. So you go on the Inspiration4 website, and then you have an opportunity to create a web page on the Shift4 Shop platform. It doesn't cost anything to do it. And it can be any idea. It doesn't have to be you know, selling electronics or something. It could, it could even have a charitable purpose. And then make a video and share it on social media and tell the world how you're going to make an impact with your business and why it should be elevated to the stars. And then that will have an independent selection process. And we will identify then our fourth and final crew member who will represent the mission spirit of prosperity. And that will be the four of us that go to space later this year. Later this year. It just seems like it's moving so quick. It is. Wow. Have you already done a lot of training over at SpaceX and so forth? I, I've snuck into the simulator a few times. I can't help myself. Like I, I want to just start pushing buttons. So as we get closer, right, the team, the group that does end up going up, will go through all that training. And although some of it's automated, everybody has to be prepared for contingencies and so forth. Right. Well, let me tell you, it was great to have you on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. I, you just come across as a thoughtful, good, gener generous person. And I knew when I started watching videos and reading about you, that you would be a great guest for the show. And I think you've proved that here today. And and I, I'm assuming this, but you're on, maybe on vacation with your kids and your family, skiing. The fact that you took time out to come on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast, I'm very humbled by that. Oh, well, I appreciate it, TJ. And thanks for having me. It really was my pleasure. Awesome.